there is one next Friday at the Calders when Haley will be talking to us. She will be bringing this first semester to an end. Um, John, thank you for organizing uh, these geological talks. Absolutely wonderful that we can add this to our U3A portfolio. So thank you to you and your team very much for that. And on Monday, we've got Robin, who's going to um, chat to us about all the very interesting different writers and authors and artists and whatever have visit, uh, Hermanus, have visited Hermanus. So we're looking forward to a very interesting final week of our first semester. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm now going to remove myself. I think the rest of you can start muting yourselves and turning off your cameras, please. Getting closer to our start, closer to our start. Right, we need to <coughs> turn up the power again. Yes, all of you, please turn off your videos as well as your mics, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've unmuted. Did you want me to say something, Ger? No, no, no. I, I, I've asked people to, to turn off their cameras and mute themselves, so I'll continue. No, I got a little message saying the host want, wants you to unmute, so I'll mute again. Yeah, we got it. We got a few minutes here just to. Ah, no, seriously, I'm just uh, preparing the, the way. Are you ready, Cameron? Yeah, as ready as I can be. Good. Cameron, do you want to start sharing your, your PowerPoint presentation? Sure. Let me do that now. Um, share screen. That should be the one. Share. Very good. Uh, Slideshow. Click on slideshow. Has it been presented yet? Is it session one? See now. Is that better? Is it in no, no, we have to click double click on slideshow and then should be on slideshow mode now. Presentation mode. Are you seeing the title slide? I can, I, yes, I see the, the thumbnails, but I want to see the full screen. Let's go on here. So this At the top. Cameron, you can start. Or oh, John, you can start with the introduction. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry about that little hiccup. Um, we can't hear you. John, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Apologies for the hiccup. I, I would like to introduce Cameron Penn Clark, He's a young geologist involved with the Council for Geoscience based in Cape Town. Cameron completed a BSc honors degree in geology and paleontology in 2011 and a PhD in, in geology in 2017 at the University of the Witwatersrand. Thereafter, he undertook postdoctoral research studies at the Aziko Museum, the Evolutionary Institute at WITS, and Durham University in the UK. He subsequently joined the Council for Geoscience in 2018, and as I said, currently based in the Western Cape. Importantly, and that's what he's going to be talking about today, he has established himself as the expert in the geology and paleontology of the Bockefeld Group here in the Western Cape and, and equally the Eastern Cape. So without further ado, I want to hand over to Cameron and I'm sure he will give us a lively and entertaining lecture. And we look forward to taking him out in the field after the, the presentation later this morning. Thank you.
Thank you very much, John. Um, good day, everyone. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, about rocks. So thank Sorry, you. Cameron, you'll have to go closer to the mic. Your sound is very low. All right. Is this better? It's better. All right. Better, yes, thank you. So thanks uh, very much for having me. Um, today's talk is on something that I'm quite interested in. And uh, it's, the, of course, the Borkefeld group, but more importantly, how it is the best preserved um, non-polar high latitude succession um, on Earth. So um, I'll get to that in a bit. So I just need to take you back in time for a little bit uh, to the, the Devonian world. Um, so Earth back then was different. The uh, plates were arranged very differently. So to the south during the Devonian period, you had a large supercontinent, Gondwana, to the north, Laurasia, and Siberia. And throughout the Devonian period, what happened was that Gondwana slowly uh, was drifting northwards. Uh, you've got a closure of the Raic and a gradual closure in a scissor motion of the Paleo Tethys Sea, uh, which would, of course, form Pangaea uh, in the Permian some uh, 180 odd, 150 odd million years later. Um, if we look at climates through time as well, um, uh, the Devonian period was a time of sort of uh, relatively warm conditions. Um, so we can actually look at, um, uh, at the mineralogical indicators of the climate. And what we can see is that there were no ice caps um, uh, during this time period. Uh, so uh, we know that at the poles, of course, it was cooler, but no ice caps. But as you can see, is that global climates were more or less equitable like they are today, is that we had this nice banding of climates uh, from the uh, poles being cooler towards the equator, warmer and drier. But the Devonian world is also important in that it was a time of innovation, depending on who you speak to. Um, a Devonian paleontologist will tell you that the world has been in stasis for a very long period of time. Nothing really exciting has happened since then in that uh, during this time period, and of course, yeah, yeah we were at the southern, right at the South Pole. But during this time period, the first uh, plants made their sort of took root on land. And by the end of the Devonian period, we had our first forests. At the same time, the first um, arthropods, or first animals moved onto land. So it started with first this invasion of these little insects and uh, arachnids. In the oceans, ammonites make their appearance, uh, but also importantly, fish, a whole bunch of fish that we take advantage for today that we eat with our chips uh, made their appearance. Uh, so first, uh, modern type sharks make their appearance. Um, uh, ray fin fish make their um, appearance as well. And then alongside this, fleshy fin fish like coelacanth make their appearance. But um, uh, so they lived alongside all of these ancient fish. So you had these spiny sharks, these jawless fish, and placoderms. But by the end of the Devonian period, those chaps went extinct. But importantly, as well, is that ancestors of these fleshy fin fish gave rise to the first tetrapods, which are our uh, extremely great ancestors. So this is Opa Kroiki Kroiki uh, uh, in the top right corner. Um, and they make their, uh, our ancestors made their first brave steps onto land uh, during the, uh, by the end of the Devonian. So, you know, quite an, uh, it's quite a, a lot went down in this time period. So this, of course, had a knock-on effect is that uh, with all of what was happening on, uh, on Earth, it, uh, the actual uh, biochemistry of Earth changed. So during this warm period on Earth, we had the greatest de uh, development or expansion of, of uh, corals on Earth. So just about everywhere except for the poles, there were uh, massive coral reefs that would extend for thousands of kilometers. But also at the same time on land is that with the rise of um, plants onto land, it's, uh, it sort of created these new ecosystems and new food webs and uh, new ways uh, uh, for, for weathering and the, uh, the formation of soils. Uh, it was also importantly, it kept a lot of mud back from getting into these marine basins. So it's part of the reason why you saw this development of the proliferation of life in the marine realm as well. But also as well as that plants had an effect at creating new geomorphic terrains. Um, so meandering rivers make their first appearance in these 
no lazy slack water conditions um, on land. It's the first time we actually see this with the rise of plants, uh, creating soils, binding soil together, etc. Now, again, with all this proliferation of life and all these things going on as well, it threw the biogeochemistry of uh, Earth out of whack. And uh, what we do see is that uh, no, at no other time in Earth's history have we seen um, have we seen a um, uh, the sort of uh, large amount of these extinction events taking place? So in this column on the right, where it's got events, is that the uh, there are you can see several extinction events that took place. So again, this had all of these knock-on effects uh, uh, with it. So whether or not this was uh, due to the rise of plants and uh, changes in ocean chemistry. Uh, those knock-on effects authors uh, combined with Milankovitch uh, events, we don't know, uh, but we're still trying to figure this out at the moment. So going back to South Africa, um, given our very unique place that we are located at uh, the southern tip of Gondwana and at the South Pole, uh, we've actually got quite a lot, lot of rocks, a large succession of rocks that were deposited during the Devonian. So this pretty much is from the um, uppermost Table Mountain group, the entire Bokapok group, and the lowermost Bitterberg group. So, and these rocks all crop out um, in the Cape Fold Belt, uh, which you know we are in right now, uh, those of us that are blessed to be in the Cape. So I'm going to be focusing on the Devonian period, going into a little bit more detail. So the big question is, well, for study these rocks, they, South Africa was located at, at high subpolar to polar latitudes during the Devonian period. So you can see on this little map over here, TA marks uh, the Cape Basin. Um, uh, but most of our understanding of what was going on in the Devonian world comes from low, uh, low latitude temperate conditions where you know, Northern Hemisphere countries are now they were at the equator. And it's quite strange given that South Africa, as well as other parts of Western Gondwana have got these beautiful um, exposures of these rocks. So it's been low hanging fruit. So why should we study um, uh, high latitude regions? So most of the information we know are from ice house world. So as we are in right now, we are, we are technically in an a ice age. But we don't really know about what was happening on at the poles in greenhouse worlds. Um, so when there were no ice caps, how were these places functioning? Um, so at high latitudes as well, solar irradiance is lower, uh, so therefore it's generally cooler. But what we do see is that we have a so seasonal um, changes in bioproductivity. Um, so even though it's seasonal, what we do see is that when there are changes in bioproductivity, they tend to be the greatest uh, regions of, gener of generation of biomass. So this little picture in the corner um, uh, shows this. Also importantly, there are periods of no uh, sunlight and periods of extended sunlight. So how were these animals and organisms living in these conditions? What were, uh, what were their stresses? Uh, what were, uh, how did they cope with it? We, we don't really know. Um, also as well, if you look at the weathering um, uh, means or weathering profiles is that you, you have a lot of higher, uh, greater incidence of mechanical weathering processes. Um, but again, this is all known from uh, ice house worlds, whereas in uh, greenhouse worlds, what, what, what was the precipitation uh, rate? We don't know. We know now that at the poles, they are actually technically more deserts than anything else because of their low rates of precip precipitation. Was this or is this the same in greenhouse worlds? We don't know. Um, we also know that at high latitudes, um, anyone who's done any sailing or, or gone out to sea, especially that have, have gone below um, or south or north of uh, 40 degrees, will know how um, how stormy the sea is in general. So uh, storminess, of course, is seasonal. It's dominated by frontal systems, um, but also importantly at the, at the poles as well, tidal ranges are, are minimal to absent, so very, very low tidal ranges. Um, the Coriolis force is at its, um, is at its greatest. Uh, so as the earth rotates, it deflects wind. So it's more stormy in general. Uh, with low tidal ranges. 
um, and these regions as well, sea level tends to be lower as a whole, so they're more sensitive to changes in, uh, in sea level rise and fall as well as temperature. So they're actually extremely sensitive environments, they fringe environments as such. Um, so that's just the reasons why these rocks are important or part of them, but now just to go to the Bokerfeld group itself. So this map is a simplified map just to show the, uh, the outcrop of the Bokerfeld. So there are uh, three subdivisions of the Bokerfeld group. There's the lower series subgroup, which was from, uh, ranges from the early to the middle Devonian uh, in age. And then overlying that is the Bido subgroup, uh, which goes into the, the uppermost Middle Devonian and its lateral equivalent, the Trucker subgroup. And you can see at about 21 degrees east, the stratigraphy of these successions change uh, because the, the actual uh, intrinsic proxies, uh, the stratigraphy of these rocks uh, changes across this boundary. So uh, this leads us to believe that in the, the, in the Cape Basin is that we must have had two sub-basins, um, uh, one to the west and one to the east. Uh, then this is just now work that I've been doing, uh, refining the uh, chronology of the Bokerfeld group based on its fossil occurrences and its environmental ranges. Um, I won't go into this, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but essentially that's what we are focusing on and it is uh, well known for its, uh, its endemic fossil fauna of the uh, Malvino Cosm, formerly the Malvino Caffric Faunal um, Assemblage or bioregional realm. So we've now managed to refine this, um, uh, this biochronology. This is now going to be refined even further with latest uh, findings we found on the swat Rickens formation, where we actually think now that the Viterbo group is much older, or parts of it are much older at least, than what we thought. So in the Borkovalk group, these are just some of the fossils that you would see, you've got these very early uh, fish and sharks, you've got these fossil trilobites and crinoids, very early fossil plants. Um, uh, then when you go up into the Witterberg group, uh, you see you know, these very uh, early trees, the earliest lampreys are known, some of the earliest arthropods from Africa are known. What I haven't shown of here is now uh, Africa, South Africa now is its first fossil tetrapod, uh, from the, the latest Devonian, which is quite exciting. Uh, now in the Hermanus area, uh, granted I haven't really done much field work of yet. These are photos that John has passed on to me. Uh, this is a road cutting by the wine estate. And typically in this area, this is what you would see as the Borkafalk group, these nice thick shale rich uh, successions and uh, of very many uh, colors. These colors are due to uh, effects of weathering, erosion, and diagenesis, which we'll get on uh, on, uh, on the field trip. So um, that's what you guys are used to seeing with the Bokovol group. I'm used to much better exposures in that I work west of here. So this is a Khamkapur dam, and typically is uh, as typical as the Bokovol group is this hogsback type topography. We've got these alternating uh, shales uh, that are overlain by sandstones. And it's because of this, uh, this, these changes in the overall um, sedimentology of the succession that gives us this characteristic hogsback succession. So that's a, a topography. So this is a Hamkapur. This is at the top section of the Borkafal group. This is at Groot uh, Rafia Ruchte and the Cedarberg. And this hogsback topography and these alternating shale and sandstone layers form the basis for the stratigraphy of the succession. So it makes mapping a joy in that it's very easy to follow these things around the basin. And um, yeah, very lacquer. Uh, so this just shows you what um, the outcrop I'm used to looks like. <laughs> um, so this is work that was done in the uh, past by Hannes Teron uh, from regional mapping, just to show uh, uh, how these successions relate to each other around the basin. There's a general uh, rule of thumb as one moves towards the north, these more sandstone rich successions are thicker and they become more amalgamated towards the north. And in the south, uh, these more mudstone uh, rich successions become thicker and amalgamate. Now, I looked at the geological maps now um, for this area and uh, out here, the Borkafal group is undifferentiated uh, in that all of these uh, muddy successions have amalgamated together 
So it's more actually more correct to just refer to the other just as the Bockefell group over here, or I guess the Bockefell formation uh, down here. But when we're in the field today, we'll see if we can try subdivide it uh, at all and also look for some fossils. So this is what um, uh, a rough idea of what the basin would have looked like. This is from uh, data from Tehran as well as others, just to show the division, how this shoreline would have looked, is that you would have had the shoreline that went around South Africa. And of course, uh, South America was to the west of here. We had two sub-basins, the Clan William sub-basin to the west and the Ogala sub-basin to the east. Um, and where we are situated, uh, here in the Overberg region, we are right at round about this boundary between the two basins. So previous work that has been done by uh, Tony Tankard uh, and uh, Barwis was that uh, they had a look at the Bokfell group, uh, ET successions, they looked at the lithological properties and the sedimentary structures, and they said, right, each of these uh, uh, mudstone, sandstone packages is a, uh, was deposited in a tidal environment that uh, underwent uh, reworking by storm activity. So, and they also assume that each of these coarsening upward cycles, uh, these successions was uniform so that these were just uh, due to changes in sea level, normal uh, processes that take place and uh, you had the same rep uh, repetition uh, back and forth. So this is just to show you an idea of what Tony Tankard and them uh, and always thought that the Borkofeld landscape would have looked like on land and then under underwater, you would see this, uh, if you're in scuba diving, that's what you would probably look at. It's a very different world to what we would be seeing today. Um, going back to the fossils, what I'm quite interested in is that these are typical fossils that you'd expect to find. So these highly endemic Malvinoclosum biota. So, um, uh, trilobites, uh, the world's earliest known shark is actually from the Bokopal group, is Puka Pampella. We also get these very interesting little starfish uh, type organisms. So here by the 50 cent coin, here's one that's been fossilized on top of the, the head of a trilobite. You have crinoids, fossil jellyfish, my uh, true love uh, brachiopods uh, as well, that's also very endemic. So yes, uh, it's quite interesting. So, Going also on, also on the fossils, is that these fossils are quite interesting, is that we can use these fossils to um, actually uh, work out paleo latitude and work out, uh, based on their similarities, which regions were most similar to each other. So uh, recent work that we've been doing was to try and revise uh, these regions, these boundaries. So in the past, we thought that there were three uh, regions that were latitudinally constrained, the Old World realm, which hovered around the equator, Eastern America's realm, which was in more temperate lat latitudes to south of the equator, and then the Malvino Capric realm. So these biogeographic regions were constrained to a specific time period in the early to middle Devonian period, and there were a bunch of endemic uh, species that, uh, that typify each of them. Um, and then towards the end of the Devonian, there's a collapse in, uh, in uh, this uh, sort of congregation of these animals, and one sees a more cosmopolitan um, uh, condition. So we've been researching this now to try to figure out uh, when I was in Durham, was, uh, why did these, how did this come about and why did it collapse? And then one of the first papers that have come out now is that we have a revised biogeography. Um, so we looked at West Gondwana um, and we, we've now seen something different, uh, a Colombian West African bioregion, uh, this Amazonian bioregion, which is just to the south of that, and then the newly defined Malvino Clausen bioregion, which I'll get on now. So the Malvino Clausen uh, bioregion is, is a sort of uh, more or less equated with the former Malvino Caffric realm. Uh, there's been a change in nomenclature in that uh, Malvino Caffric holds uh, offensive terminology, but also as well, it, it's been shown that it, it doesn't, uh, that it exists, but with some modification. So these are your typical Malvino Clausen uh, guys. These are the brachiopods. So brachiopods are shelly type organisms uh, as well, very interesting in their biology. Um, quite boring animals. They just really sat on the seabed and, uh, 
and ate and reproduced and did not didn't do much. So a very enviable lifestyle in a lot of ways. But there were a group of these guys that are unique just to these high latitude regions, and some of them are unique only to South Africa. So highly endemic, um, and there's a bunch of them. The more exciting stuff, I guess, are the trilobites. Um, so again, there are a group of trilobites that are only known from the Malvino Corson region and nowhere else. Some, of course, are only known to South Africa and nowhere else. But these main uh, endemic groups uh, coexisted alongside more um, uh, cosmopolitan groups of animals, so echinoderms, other shelly organisms, so like clams, um, and then snails, which were more, um, more cosmopolitan, uh, less specialist than anything else. But what's weird about the Malvino Cosin realm is that there are things that aren't here. So well, and things that are here that are abundant. So conulorids, um, which are a type of fossil jellyfish, uh, tentaculatids, which are a shelly organism, which are um, which now we know are actually similar to brachiopods, and then hyolithids, which are another weird group of mollusks. But other things are quite rare. So um, graptolites are quite rare, which is a pity because they're graptolites would be able to take these rocks better. Uh, conodonts are also um, unknown uh, from here, which is also a bit of a bugger because these guys, they're little tooth elements we can use to correlate uh, with other regions uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, ammonites or ammonoids are unknown. Uh, you do see them in places, but they are sort of, sort of drifted into these basins. And then corals and bryozoans are also rare. So again, we're quite buggered in that we don't really know how these things, how the Bokeval group correlates with the rest of the world. So if we had to take this combined with our knowledge of the, the geology of the area of the Bokeval group, sedimentology, as well as these four, the fauna, we, we kind of can reconstruct the paleoecology of these seaways is that they were, the fauna lived in cold water or cool water, high latitude regions. Uh, there must have been some uh, thermal boundary, um, some ocean current that uh, prevented any long-term mixing with uh, warmer regions. These guys were clearly specialists. But what we can see from the ecology is that these guys love to live on the seafloor itself. Um, so they had benthonic uh, lifestyles and there weren't uh, any carbonate reefs and there were no ice caps. So I'm now busy working now to try and figure out how this, the Malvino Tosin realm came about and how it disappeared um, and uh, what were these uh, drivers. So as I said, we've got very poor um, chronostratigraphic constraint. Um, but what we do know is that when the Malvina Causan realm disappears, we see these sort of uh, invader um, taxa that come into the basin. So, uh, Troptoleptis is one of these brachiopods, is another guy, Rapidothyrus. And when they come in the basin, the Malvina Causan fauna just aren't there. Um, stuff that we know from South America is that it seems as if, um, so in Bolivia, uh, Argentina, as well as in Brazil and the Falklands, is that it seems as if these things could be related to uh, changes in sea level rise and fall that have been seen elsewhere in the world. And that the right time period to see this, um, but you know it's very very shaky. Um, again, the successions over here in South America and in South in uh, the Falklands are more vegetated over. Um, or uh, they are inaccessible. You don't really have as much good outcrop as we do in South Africa. So I thought, well, let's try to tackle this. So it does seem, this is just to show uh, the idea from South America, what's happening is that these changes in sea level uh, opened up these, uh, these sort of former seaways that were closed and they created new seaways for the uh, warmer water to come down into the, towards the south brought these invading taxa and uh, these Malvino Tosin guys didn't like warm water and uh, they expired. So this is one idea um, but what we are seeing now with the latest research that we are doing is that we have seen uh, we've compared global uh, temperature um, fluctuations for the Devonian period against um, uh, against uh, the longevity, I guess, for lack of a better word, of these biogeographic areas. 
So what we have seen is that there was a cold phase in the beginning of the uh, Devonian period, a short cold phase. And this cold phase with the, the rise of this cold phase, we see a rise in, um, in endemism and the creation of these biogeographic uh, regions. And then towards the end of the Aphelion, going to the Javetian, we see there's an upswing in temperature. And with this upswing in temperature, we see a collapse of these biogeographic regions, not just in uh, at the South Pole, but elsewhere in the world. And we see that there is a more, there's a drive towards these more cosmopolitan, more mixed faunas. So what the question is now is what caused this cold snap? And what caused the warm uh, this warming trend? Um, so we're trying to figure this out. And now going back to the rocks. Um, so I've done, as I said, I've done most of my research in the Cedarberg in the type area, and I'm hoping that what we can do is uh, with this uh, lecture is I can show you what I've seen, and uh, we can take what I've seen over here as well as what other people have seen, and apply it to the rocks over here in uh, around Hermanus and in the Overberg region. Um, so again, quite nice, the, the tectonism is quite low, these rocks are just tilted over really, and it looks as if they've been deposited yesterday, and one can see the stratigraphy quite nicely. So um, I've, over the past few years, I've gone and studied both these successions, the series subgroup as well as the Budo subgroups, so this is just to show the stratigraphy of these successions and what one sees. So this is for the series subgroup, this is for the Bido subgroup. So during my studies, what I've seen is that there are eight lithofascies associations. So when we say lithofascies association, it's, a, um, it's the conditions under which the rock was deposited. And from there, um, you can, this is normally, uh, you can interpret the environment from there. So because we know that these rocks were deposited in such a way under certain conditions, we can use those data to figure out the environments in which they were deposited in. So what we've seen is that there are three broad types of environment that one sees is that you've got a storm and wave dominated shallow marine setting. So similar to our shoreline now that we, we've got around South Africa, so we'd, you'd have a beach, you'd have a shore face and an offshore region, and then all the um, sort of intermediaries between those three big divisions. A transgressive barrier lagoon, so then in places around our shoreline, we've got barrier and lagoon systems, but this is quite different uh, in this sort of inf uh, case of here. And then again, wave influence deltaic systems, which we see again as well in some parts around our shoreline where we've got these deltas that have been modified by wave activity. So by far the shorelines like we have today, uh, those environments were more most prominent prevalence around the Bokerfeld group. So most of the Bokerfeld group shows it and these little colors just represent these different uh, sub environments, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail in a bit. And this is just a cross-sectional profile just to show you how a beach works uh, for and how a shore face works for uh, lack of a better uh, word and I can of course share this with you uh, to read over because there's a lot going on here it's actually better to do this in the field hands-on so this is one of these coarsening upward successions so you can see there's a lower shaley bit uh, to the right of the image and an upper sandy bit so that's what uh, you'd see at the growth scale, but to a sedimentologist, we see things a little bit differently. We see, of course, the offshore would be more towards the right in this image, is that you've got a capping sandstone, which uh, accumulated in the uppermost portion of the shore face and a uh, and beach. We had a, this blue part of here is an intermediary. This is the lower shore face, and this green and blue is where the offshore and the, the lower shore face intermingled with one another. So you see little bits of both. If we go and put our nose on the rocks, these offshore environments tend to be quite muddy. I guess this is what we are going to see a lot of here in Hermanus, um, quite muddy. Um, in places, you do see these carbonate-rich horizons. So uh, we're trying to figure out how these carbonates form. You've got the odd sandstone that will crop out from time to time. But importantly, the mudstones are where you'd you find all of these interesting fossils and uh, fossil spur as well. So they are quite nice if you're looking for fossils. The shells are where you want to be at. 
Then as we move up the succession, one sees uh, you start seeing uh, more of an influence of storm and wave activity, because this is you're starting to move into the breaker zone as you're climbing up the succession. One starts to see more of these, uh, these storm scour beds, and then you get into these storm scour beds become more prominent. So you can see here you've got these storm scour beds intermingling, uh, sharply interbedding with these more uh, shaly units. Um, and again, when we have a look at them, if we put our nose on them, we can see there's a lot of sedimentological indicators to show storm and wave activities. The type of bedding called hummocky crust stratification, uh, which you can see with these very low angled hummocks and swales, and a special type of rippling called wave ripple lamination, with symmetrical ripples. We also see these giant um, uh, gutter casts. So if you can imagine, so these things look like channels, but these gutter casts are where these uh, uh, these big storms sort of come in. And I oh, thank you, John. Uh, where these big storms would have come in, and they would have really chowed the sea floor up quite badly. Um, so uh, these are also things that we would see. And this is just if you put your nose on it. Uh, you can see a lot of indicators over here that would indicate that. Um, and this is just to show what hummocky cross stratification looks like in wave ripple lamination. So from these proxies, um, we can figure out environment. Again, in the uh, lower shore face, we do see uh, fossils. So some animals were seem to be more um, adept at living in these conditions. In fact, shore faces are the most bioproductive regions on Earth uh, at present. Um, again, and you can see this from the trace fossils, there are lots of fossil spur. These animals loved, think life was good on the, the shore face. And occasionally you get the one or two plants that get blown into the basin, because uh, of course these, these are stormy conditions. And I'm sure if we had to fast forward a couple million years from now, and have a look at the fossil record of our modern shorelines, we would probably see similar things. Uh, then above this, these sandstones or storm sandstones become thicker as you get into more shallow water and they become, this is what the lower shore, the proximal part of the lower shore face would see look like. And again, you've got very, very thick hummocky cross stratification. These move more into uh, indicators for fair weather action. So uh, the uppermost shore face and beach environments. So again, we see a different type of cross bedding. Um, uh, to indicate this uh, changeover. Um, you do in these beach environments see uh, things that look like fossil plants and uh, plant roots impressions, uh, as well as some coalified plant remains. Uh, so we know that there were plant, we were very close to the source at which plants were growing. So these are also some of the, in some of these places, there are pseudo coal deposits. These are probably the oldest coals um, from Africa. Um, I, we just need to try and de demonstrate it um, better uh, in future, but that I'll leave for someone else to do. And getting into this transgressive barrier island lagoon, the Tratra formation, this is quite unique. As far as I know, this is the only true lagoonal, high latitude lagoonal succession um, in uh, Western Gondwana, other than the Vitpoort formation, but this would be older. Um, this is just in a specific part of the basin, the Tratra Buopla succession. So this is just to show what it looks like in the field. Uh, again, we know what a, we've all been to a tidal flat before in a lagoon. We know that it operates very differently. Lagoons are quite sheltered. You don't really, see, uh, waves very rarely only in big storms will they break uh, the beach barrier and have an influence in lagoons. Um, Never mind that, this is from a publication. But what's nice over here, we can see these nice uh, tidal couplets. So you can see where you've got slack water and, uh, and flood water conditions. Uh, with these mud couplets, of course, the mud would uh, be deposited uh, during slack water conditions at high tide, the sand at low tide conditions. We can see some mud crack surfaces. Um, we can see evidence for algal sort of puckering on the surface uh, of it. So a very, very nice succession. But this we'll get to in a bit formed under very specific conditions. Because remember, as we said, tidal successions are rare in high latitude conditions. So this was under very, very special circumstances that this formed. There's also quite a lot of fossil square 
over here. So again, we see uh, evidence for um, organisms, you know, making these excursions onto the tidal flats. So they were starting to crawl onto land, and yeah, life seemed like it was quite good. Um, lots of burrows, uh, lots of biological activity taking place. Um, I won't go into this over here. So this is the actual transgressive part. So here we've got a record. So that was of the, the lagoon. Above this is the transgressive beach barrier. And this is this newly defined hood refer member. And um, this has got very funny weathering effects that one sees in the field. Um, unfortunately, I don't think you'll see the truck reformation here, but if I do see it today, I'll point it out to you. It's very, very characteristic. But um, essentially, this was a beach barrier. So as sea level rose, the beach barrier migrated landwards. And as it did, it migrated landwards. It, uh, it plowed through the older deposits. So um, it's also quite interesting. You've got these uh, buried shell beds. Um, if you ever go to the Cedarburg, you'll see these shell beds. You can actually see the old sea floor as it was 400 million years ago. Um, so this obviously has a colleague of mine from the UK, him and I shimmied underneath this rock to go and look um, at this old sea floor that we were studying. So to try and figure out uh, how these organisms, um, these communities, it's a snapshot in time, how these animals were interacting with each other. So but that's a story for another day. Uh, this is just to show um, what happens with storm erosion with uh, rises in sea level. If you look at the image towards the right, uh, the lower right on the B shore face retreat, and Haley will speak to you more about this from her work that she's doing on the Agullis Plain, is that as sea level rises, storm wave base encroaches onto land. And what it does is it reworks the beach barrier and it plow, which plows into the lagoon and throws a bit of the sediment into the offshore environment as well. But what's nice is that uh, deposition tends to be quite rapid. So you have got these snapshots in the lagoonal environment that are preserved as well as in the shore face that are preserved. So very, very special succession. Uh, then going into the wave influence delta, this succeeds the truck reformation. This is in the Boerplas. Um, this is just to show you what a delta looks like. And um, yeah, uh, this over here, we, the, the sediment's logical features show that it accumulated, it was influenced by wave and storm activity. So it's nice, again, we see some more hummocky crust stratification and uh, intermingling with the subaqueous channels, which is quite cool. Um, so quite nice outcrops towards the upper left. This is at Swartkrantz, and uh, we really need a, a very adept climber to go climb, uh, shimmy down uh, the cliff face. There's a person in the corner from scale to actually go and sample these black shells just to see if these might be pseudocols because when you go to the bottom of these cliff faces, you can see there are colified plant remains. But what's nice is that these sediments logical features, what's nice is that you can see cross sections through these old river channels. So these are dunes, this image that I've activated towards the left. These are dunes that are migrating in the channel and to the right, this is at right angles of the same cutting you are seeing a cross-sectional profile of the same set channels. Uh, so you can actually see the point bars and the overbanks, which is quite clear. Um, you are seeing a, an ancient uh, river system that is about 400 million years old. Um, so this is really, really cool. This is just to show uh, the changes. So how from top to bottom, it should actually be the other way around since geologists work uh, with the youngest at the top, oldest at the bottom. But essentially what we think happened is that there was a period of low sea level, there was the formation of this incised valley, this incised valley became flooded, so it, it created the accommodation space for a tidal flat to form. Uh, there must have been, it must have been uh, more of an estuary than anything else. Um, and then as uh, sea level dropped, this uh, estuary um, built out towards the sea and became a delta. So we looked at all these rocks, you might think, okay, cool story. What what does this all mean? Well, since we are able to have a look at the change in environments through time, we therefore can figure out changes in sea levels through time. So what this uh, diagram shows is uh, the um, what we call sequences. So these sequences we can figure out. These are constrained between uh, periods of maximum sea level rise or maximum sea level fall. And from this, we can create sequences. 
And from there, we can take these sequences and infer changes in sea level. So this is a change. This is just for the Borkafal group. Uh, the latest research that we've done now is in the lower Viterbo group. So this will be revised soon is to show what the sea level was doing in the past. So from here, we can see is that these red lines show changes in uh, where the greatest changes in sea level took place. So these were at the base of the, the Borkafal group, at the base of the, the Trutra formation, at the base of the Bido subgroup, and at the base of the Kuruport formation. So what I mean by biggest changes in sea level is where you are seeing the greatest shift in environments. Um, so those are what we would call um, second order uh, changes in sea level. So first order would be at a global scale, second order would be more closer to home, and then third order changes are changes in sea level within those uh, second order changes. So again, uh, we are now able to see changes in sea level through time. Um, how does this compare to, to global sea level? Well, it does seem uh, remember as well as I was saying is that uh, high latitude regions are very sensitive to changes in sea level, is that what we can see is that there seems to be some correlation um, with the global sea level curve. It's a little bit problematic in that we don't really have any good age constraints uh, to do this. If we did, it would be actually be quite nice because then we could calibrate uh, the high or the changes in sea level happening at high latitudes to those at low latitudes to make a more informed uh, decision what was going on. So going again back to the, the fossils is that um, we've seen this is work that I'm doing now with guys in the UK is we've now looked at these fossils through time but what we've noticed is that there are changes in biodiversity and these red lines that I'm putting on here now are just to show where you've got these changes in biodiversity. So we can see is that through time, there's a stepped disappearance of the fauna uh, of the Malvino Torsen realm in South Africa. Um, and at one point, midway of there, you can see there's these guys just disappear altogether, and you've got these new organisms that come in uh, later on. So, this is something that we've been questioning what's going on. So, we can see is that the initial observations is that the Malvino Torsen, when they came, they took over, uh, but there's a decline, a stepwise decline. Uh, so we don't, we've been investigating what's going on. So when you compare this to the sea level curve that we've reconstructed, there's an almost one-to-one -one fit, is that changes in sea level were influencing the biology uh, of the succession. So we can see is that with the first, uh, the Malvino cousin uh, fauna come in with the transgression with the rise in sea level, um, with the drop in sea level, there were subsequent drops in sea level. There are declines in the, the fauna. There's a, is a, um, but what is quite weird is that uh, where the Malvino Torsen uh, realm disappear, there's a rise in sea level. There's a dead zone where nothing takes place. And then these new invading taxa come in with, a, again, with this new with the second order transgression. So we've been trying to figure out what's going on. So again, we've looked at the fossil spur in this dead zone where there aren't really any fossils, what's going on. So we've looked at the fossil spur and we've looked at the activities of these animals. So these are just the different activities. So Pasechnia are crawling, Repechnia are sort of, um, or Pasechnia are grazing traces, Repechnia are walking traces, Domechnia uh, living traces, Podechnia are feeding traces, Kubechnia are when an animal molts, it buries itself to molt. And what we've seen is in the Barbo and Bach uh, formation, this is where the Malvino Torsen make their last stand. But above that, you can see is that there's a huge change in the way that these animals were living. Superimposed on this are the most bioproductive regions. Again, these are shore face uh, regions. So what we've noticed is that these line up with changes in sea level. Um, but that there is this little zone where nothing takes place. So we've zoomed in on it. We've seen just below, there's, there's a hell of a lot of bioproductivity taking place. Um, so lots were going on. It was a good time to be alive. But just above that, there's nothing. These things almost look like pseudo-turbidites. Um, so yeah. So now we've, 
managed to refine this extinction level event, and it seems as they are decrease, they disappear with a drop in sea level. So now we are trying to figure out what the trigger for this is. Um, so that's a story that's in development, which hopefully next year I'll be able to present to you guys on. Um, so yes, so that's all I have to say on that note. Uh, so many thanks, thanks as well to the uh, U3A and the Overberg guys. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about stuff that bores most people. Um, and then also thanks to all of these guys who actually believe in researchers and they give us money to do stuff. So again, thank you to my employer, the Council for Geoscience, my former alma mater, Vitz, you know, Vitz is number one, um, and then uh, Durham um, as well. So thank you very much, guys. I appreciate the talk, the opportunity. Thank you. Excellent, Cameron. Thank you very much. If you can stop your share and then put your camera on, then we can ask sure. questions. John, you can take over. Cameron, while we wait for John, just a question. Uh, uh, okay, as you're thanks, aware, Cameron, that was fantastic. Um, and, and let's throw it open to. I think we must just mute John. Before anybody asks any questions, if Cameron can hear me, I just want to, Patricia here, I just want to say, wow. Go for it. Wow. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. I shall have to go through the whole thing again to get details memorable in my little mind because that was so detailed, so interesting. Thank you so much and what tremendous work you do. Thank you sure. to you and your team. Thank you. And yeah, hopefully today in the field, uh, you'll be joining us and we can, maybe we'll be able to uncover a nice discovery on in one of these road cuttings. I'm quite eager to see it. It's a lot better to explain this in the field um, uh, than on a presentation. So, but thank you very much. Henny, you were asking a question, but you broke up. Are you back? Are you back with us? Can, can you hear me? Uh... We can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, Cameron, yeah, just taking into account that a large part of the audience are non-geologists with a usually different perspective on time. Yeah. Uh, as to, you know, quite short-lived. So in the beginning, you were mentioning that we are in a cold and ice age. Now, a lot of them with this climate change going on are thinking, okay, how can you say that? Now, can you sort of make a guess or just say to us, how long it's going to take for us to get out of it into a tropical environment in terms of geological time? Well, right now, so right now we are, um, again, what I was showing with those sea level changes is that you get these big changes in sea level and these smaller changes within it. Similarly with climate, it's the same thing. So we are in an overall ice earth condition, but we are in a warm period within that ice earth condition. Now, what, humans are doing with anthropogenic effects um it is you can see the data it does seem to indicate it does indicate that humans are spurring this on we are making it this interstadial warm period much warmer than what it should be and much more rapidly so if we continue on this path you know yeah it's gonna uh, maybe you know within the next century it could be more warmer and we might have an ice free um, uh, in northern hemisphere the Arctic Circle might be ice free. So it's very, this is the problem with being a geologist is that uh, we work in relative terms, we don't work in definite terms. And any geologist who works in definite is a liar. Um, so uh, we can only, we can't give an exact amount of time on this. But what we are seeing is that humans are, are buggers. We are really making things much, uh, we, we're actually making it much worse for ourselves. But then again, um, as uh, Spike McCarthy used to tell me, or tell us, he said, yeah, you know, actually global warming is a good thing. Um, it does, it expands uh, more arable land for agriculture to take place. He says, what you don't want is the big freeze. Uh, that, he, he always used to warn us, that is a problem. But um, right now, what we do see is that these fluctuations in temperature through time are um, mainly related to what we call Milankovitch cycles. So, 
uh, astronomical cycles that uh, through time Earth's orbit is slightly closer to is more elliptical, and it is um, uh, slightly closer to the sun at times and slightly further from the sun at times. And other times it becomes more um, circular, more more. I'm not sure what the word is. More circular yeah. and yeah. It's more uh, elliptical. At other times as well, the tilt of the the axis of the uh, the Earth how it tilts. At sometimes the the hemispheres are closer to the sun. Other times they're further away. And then uh, the orbit of the Earth uh, itself on its axis can wobble. So these things almost work like clockwork. And uh, these Milankovitch cycles they normally work on the order of uh, anywhere between fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand years. So we've been in our interstadial now. I think this warm period has lasted. I, I think. Stand to be corrected for last, uh, probably I think the last 15, 20, 15 to 25,000 years. So we are in, in astronomical terms and in geological terms, we are maybe halfway through our warm period. Um, and we've still got another 50 odd thousand years to go before we go into a cold period. So that's about the best estimate I can give. And don't quote me on this because uh, I don't want to lose my job. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. And Cameron, the last ice age was 20,000 years ago and the modern climate is really only 10,000 years. The whole, okay. of human, the whole of human written history and civilization is only in the last 10,000 years. I just want to mention that the estuaries near where you are now, the Klein River and the Bot River, uh, they would be nice models, I think, from what your diagram showed for the tra tra formation. Mm. They're, they're, they're filling in a delta at the uh, river end and uh, flood tidal delta from the sea end, and they, they've got a live they're, they're gradually filling up and then they'll be excavating next time sea level goes down. So, a talk I gave yesterday to the whale coast people, I stressed that the coast was normally. Uh, 130 meters below sea level for most of the time in a wide coastal plain and then temporarily just got a short period of relatively warm with a narrow coast plain and a high sea level oh i see all right yeah no thanks thanks john Pleasure. Cameron, i have a question can you explain uh, the hamiki cross sections i think it's the right pronunciation hamiki cross sections uh, Hamiki cross stratification. Yeah, so sure. So Hamiki cross stratification is for a long time in South Africa has been a bit of a dirty word um, in that uh, for a long time, uh, for most of the world, um, that they didn't believe, people didn't believe that this existed. So essentially, um, the problem with Hamiki cross stratification is that it's one of these bed forms that is, incre is incredibly difficult for us to model in a lab setting. But what we think, or well, how it forms um, with the, the more recent work that has been done, is that the idea is, is that you have a storm surge that comes in. The storm surge, uh, well, as a storm uh, cell, you can imagine what's happening with the energy in water is that it's moving in a circular uh, uh, fashion. Uh, as that storm surge, that storm wave, that orbital um, motion comes in it intersects the the shore face intersects that that energy backs up and you have the formation of waves now storm waves uh, interact with the shore face a lot deeper because uh, these are bigger they're exceptional waves that come through so what it does is it scours the top surface of that bed and it forms these very broad uh, long wavelength um, hummock and swell type topography um, and uh, that sediment gets entrained into the the flow and it gets dumped back down and it settles out and it mimics this uh, topography this low angle hummock and swell topography so the issue that we've got is that in our wave labs uh, uh, when we do uh, any hydrodynamic modeling is that i don't think our um our flow labs are large enough uh, to actually observe uh, this phenomenon. Uh, 
So what we do know is that if, um, if there's if that hummocky cross stratification only occurs in a very specific range, grain size range. Um, in that, if you model the these conditions in slightly coarser sediment, you form wave ripples. So that's how we know is that uh, the two are genetically related. Wave ripples are a more coarser grained uh, manifestation of hummocky cross stratification and more finer grained deposits. So um, if you guys come around the field trip, I'll point it out to you. It's very, very characteristic um, uh, sort of thing. And in South Africa, we, it's only really, people are only really appreciating it now, like about 30, 40 years down the line after um, it was proposed. So the actual old name for it was wacky cross bedding, which I think should have stayed. Uh, uh, I preferred the old name. Uh, of uh, of it, but it's a, it's quite nice to see forms pretty patterns as well. Um, so yeah. So typically, how thick are these stratifications? So uh, the actual stratifications themselves, going down to the level of bed, they're normally about a centimeter at most. But these storm beds as well can be quite thick. They can uh, a coast set of these storm beds where you've got a prolonged period of storm activity. Bless me, can be anywhere um, to of uh, tens of tens of centimeters to um, up to about a meter, meter and a half in the most uh, distal regions of the shore face. As of course, as you move close to the shoreline, these packages can be quite uh, thicker. But um, if you're actually looking at one pulse of sedimentation or one sort of event, ah maybe about 40 centimeters at most uh, of an entire package within a, within a storm cycle. Um, so about 10 to 20 surges uh, that are preserved in there. So they're, they're not very thick, but they, you will see them. Uh, they will stand out once your eye gets in uh, for it. Cameron, this is John here coming in, getting back to some of the things we talked about last night. Um, we have these gorgeous, colorful rocks here on the Western Cape, and you know we've now seen that they have a great deal to offer and show us and teach us about the Devonian and particularly sort of you know Earth history at that time. But, but if you look around the Western Cape and obviously the Eastern Cape too, the, these rocks support our agriculture. You yes. know, they, they were originally sort of considered to be quite boring. And it was the same with the old TM, you know, the Table Mountain sandstone, you know, boring um, bunch of, of white rocks. And now it turns out they, you know, they have huge um, aquifers. And we here in the, in, in the Western Cape, particularly Hermanus and now Cape Town, making use of those massive aquifers. So, so just give us a little bit of background about, you know, the sort of broader economic aspects of these amazing rocks and, you know, why they are important and why we should actually be basically looking after them and understanding them better. Yeah, so yeah, that's actually quite correct, uh, John. So um, if you look at most of the agriculture in uh, the Western Cape, it's supported on uh, about three to four different rock types. So the Borkafelt group, the shells of the Borkafelt are one of them. Uh, some agriculture takes place in uh, these more recent aged deposits. Um, um, the, the West Coast group um, uh, sort of stuff, uh, the Cape Flats, you know, that sort of sandy type stuff that John Rogers uh, knows, uh, or like the back of his hand in Haley Corthra. Um, there's also a lot of agriculture that takes place in more uh, loamy, muddy type rocks in the uh, Karoo Super Group, so in the Eka Group, as well as the, um, the Beaufort Group, the Lomos Beaufort Group. So these rocks, over here um, form uh, these magnificent, very rich soils uh, that, well, not very rich, but rich soils that um, allow agriculture to take place. So what we are doing now at the Council for Geoscience is we're actually mapping with our um, expanded mapping program is that we actually are mapping these things in a hell of a lot of detail, more so than what we have in the past. Um, but these, 
these rocks, we do need to pay attention to them. And we need to also look at this also from a geomorphic perspective is where are these rocks occurring where you've got, I don't know, changes in aspect or we've got specific aspect uh, conditions where the slopes face a certain, uh, face the north or face the prevailing rain direction where their, um, uh, their topography changes, where they're more gentle, where you will expect to have thicker soil profiles being developed, et cetera. But these are the backbone of the economy um, in a lot of ways. I mean, we can do without uh, computers and cell phones, but we can't do that food. Um, and definitely water as well. So the, the Table Mountain group and the Borkefeld group, that couplet, uh, these guys are the heroes of the Western Cape. Um, I don't mean to sound biased or anything, but I, I don't like being thirsty or, or hungry. So thanks, thanks, rocks. Appreciate it. <laughs> but um, we do need to conserve it, you're right. And um, we do need to look at having, um, in South Africa, we need to probably stop thinking of, uh, when we think of economic resources, we think of metals and minerals. We don't think of agriculture. Uh, we, it's always, oh, the ARC will sort that out for us. The ARC just look at the soil, they don't look at geology. Um, and I think it's high time that all of us started doing this now um, and, and appreciating it more. Cameron, uh, quite, a, quite a while ago, uh, when we were doing work off the west coast of the Orange River for an environmental impact assessment, we deployed a thing called a benthic boundary layer experiment to deploy and to record currents in non-stormy conditions and stormy conditions. And uh, we didn't have a lot of success, but the, the idea was very good. Uh, a place to do that sort of work actually could be Walker Bay because the swell comes in from the southwest absolutely parallel mm -hmm. to the beach there. And the CSI, I've done quite a lot of wave research decades ago, but there'd be room to do uh, an experiment uh, of measuring the turbidity of the water in non-stormy times and stormy times. And then also to have a video camera recording uh, those, those things at the same time. And mm -hmm. then also to go out with underwater photography to photograph the modern analog for having cross stratification. So I don't think I've read any paper which says this is what they look like in the modern environment. Yeah, this is the big problem. Uh, and also why a lot of South African geologists have been very hesitant about recognizing it in the field. A lot of the times people would just blow it off and just say, oh, well, it's, it's, they would just call it cross bedding. They wouldn't say anything further or oh, these are clearly uh, subaqueous channels, but where's the channel? You can't see it. There's no, no nice ribbon form shape, but any use. Um, that would be first prize is that if we could observe it in the modern uh, day, it would be it would be big news. Um, so maybe it would be a worthwhile thing. I should uh, speak to Haley about this, I guess, and just see if uh, we. I'm not sure if CSR if their boats are still going and their, their wave uh, or their shoreline research units still going, but it would be a worthwhile thing uh, to do. And also, I know Mac. Uh, has been interested or is quite interested in bed form modeling. Um, so yeah, it, uh, so walk away, but we will contact you at, uh, about this as well, just to give you a, a call. Maybe we can have a little uh, Teams meeting uh, back uh, in Cape Town. Thank you. Yeah, good to hear that Walker Bay is starting to get attention. I mean, it's quite a critical area for lots of reasons. Um, you know, so this whole, you know, this whole effort on coastal geology and our local geology becomes more and more important. And, and obviously for us people up here in the Overberg and the Hebelanada Valley, the, the terroir is terribly important for, for particularly obvious reasons. So, so yeah. that, you know, we've got a whole lot of work farmers out there waiting for you to tell them where they can and can't grow you know the vineyards and what sort of wine they can make from these different areas yeah so, so there's a you know it gets back to my point about there's a whole economic um aspect to all of this geology of ours and we and we best taking greater attention about it yeah, I mean, as I was saying to you yesterday, is that it, it blew my mind when I. Uh, Any other that. question? Keep going, Cameron. 
Lost you. Pardon? Oh, no, just with the, it's what John was saying with terroir. Um, uh, when, because uh, uh, I've been in touch with a guy who's quite big in the Cape Winelands area. When he explained to me terroir, I took him out into the field on a dig that we were doing out in near Worcester. And we were pulling out these fossil sharks just recently and fossil plants. And he said, yeah, that's the ter that uh, contributes to the terroir of the wines in this region. And, I, and when he explained to me the concept of terroir, where he said you, there's actually no real English word for it, he said you could grow uh, these vines on soils that have a similar uh, geochemistry. Um, and the wine would be would taste different. It's the fossils that add the, the that sort of um, the juge of the wine. Um, I, it blew my mind. So I'm hoping one of these wine farmers makes a, a range of like kiff, uh, fossil inspired paleontology inspired inspired wines. I mean, I'll throw my entire wine collection away to make uh, a display of those. But uh, one can only hope. <laughs> Is this real divine? <laughs> Yeah, oh, I mean, we could have called mulled Devonian wine or, or something, something Lani. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let those guys get creative with it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've just got one last okay. point. Uh, mm -hmm. Years ago, Bobby Danchin did a double volume PhD on the geochemistry of the Bokkefeld to try and see whether different parts of the Bokkefeld had different geochemistry. <laughs> it didn't have much difference, but it might be very useful to the the wine farmers now, all these years later. Uh, was that thesis yeah, yeah. at UCT, John? Yes, it was. Uh, could you send me a, a, a link or, or the title of it? I, I can try to request it from, uh, how long ago was it? Oh, about 40, 50 years ago. If you could just send me a link for the title, I'll contact the library at UCT just to see if they can scan uh, that thesis in for me. I'd appreciate that. Uh, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Thank you, John. Appreciate yeah, and, it. And John, and John, we should really be finding all of those old samples and doing the trace elements, which uh, would be much more precise today. So you know, that, that's that's a fascinating idea that we've got to go and do it again. Yeah, okay. Cameron, I think it answers the question you posed earlier where you said, why do we study these rocks? It is to improve the wine. I, I, thank you for, for clarifying that. For <laughs> Anything that helps the wine farmers, we will support. And I'm happy my, our conglomeration of geoscientists are helping. Thank you, John, for your conglomeration. I appreciate them very much. Thank you, Cameron. This has been sure. fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks. And the the geological discussion is so <laughs> worthwhile and so interesting. Lovely to hear you chaps all chipping in. Sure, thank you. A hand up from somebody who only has a number, I don't know the name, 415-869. Yeah. yeah, it's John John Trustwell. For some reason, I've, I'm given a number and not a name. Um, maybe it's a reflection of my relic status, I'm not sure. But it's uh, worth mentioning that that Tim Hamilton Russell, who really was the the starter of the wine in the in the uh, in the Emerald Valley, did so fifty years ago, uh, after having exhaustive tests done on the climate and and the soil, and uh, from from that fifty years ago has has flowed the, the wine industry here. In the in the same year, um, 1971, Saki Rust and I wrote the first um, stratigraphic South African stratigraphic code, and that was the first time that we had recognised the fairly primitive distinction between biostratigraphy and and lithostratigraphy. And you, Cameron, have made the rocks sing in both ways, both in, in terms of their lithology, but also in terms of the, the life forms that many of us perhaps hadn't really grasped how much had been done in, 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 in that regard. And I'd like to thank you very much for your talk.
No, th thank you. And it's you guys who actually, you know, laid the foundations for us. And really, thank you guys as well. Uh, really, I mean, uh, laying down the foundational work, sure. Uh, the time when you guys had to do uh, work, it was really still um, a really open field. And thank you guys uh, uh, for, for inspiring us to go further as well. And, and John, with that contribution, we need to come and sit with you and get you to recount some of that history of the Himalaya Valley. So I'll, I'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. You can answer that, Cameron. Okay. Pardon? Uh, answer that. Oh, what was the question of that? I didn't hear it. Could you repeat? You said you, you must come and do your work here in the Hebron and Arda Valley. Oh, yes. Are you coming? Yeah, you're good. No. Don't we? And we're going to get John Truswell involved as well. You've got to get yes. him out there doing some remapping. Yeah, so with time, uh, we should be moving, uh, should be moving down. Uh, so we've uh, this, we've identified priority areas that need to be uh, tackled first, of course. Um, so we've just finished mapping the or remapping the northern portion of the Clan William sheet. I'm busy doing the southern portion now with my team. We've remapped Franschhoek and Villiersdorp, which are the, the map sheets just to the north of this. And of course, uh, I'm not sure what's happening with our program this year if we're going to move down south uh, on those sheets as well. But it's, it's Bicky Bicky Mark Buyer, um, and yeah, we'll get there. Uh, but I'm I'm excited for today to go up the valley and see um, what what is there um, because yeah, it's it's all it's going to be new to. Me. Okay, we we we're gonna have to talk to your boss and get your priorities reset. <laughs> yeah, good luck. <laughs> Okay, we're getting closer to Thanks, the Cameron. Time we have to meet for the field trip. So, unless there are some important last questions, I think we must terminate this now. Um, Just got the last Duncan. comment that in 1970, Bobby Danchin did his PhD on general geochemistry. And in 1971, Pierre Hoff made this important play. He did his PhD on the trace elements of the, of the shells. Great. <laughs> Good. Cameron, can I also add my gratitude to what you've presented this morning, all the detailed work you're doing? Amazing stuff, wonderful work. Thank you very much. And I'm so glad that you are able to come down here. Sure, thank it. you. And I really hope you'll be spending more time in this area mapping the yeah. detail. Yeah, no, I hope so. Um, um, I need to actually start using my leaf uh, to, to actually uh, enjoy the Cape. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely be here in future. Thank, and thank you. you for everybody who tuned in this morning and I'm going to end the meeting now. Goodbye everybody. Bye bye and everybody. What time, do we, what bye, time do we meet and where? Thank you. Cheers and thanks. We're gonna meet in the wine village. Where, where exactly the wine village? There are various areas, in the parking area behind or where? No, I think in the parking area in front where we can see, you know, people coming um, right. on the corner. Yeah. Okay. Look Good. forward to seeing everyone there. Thanks. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks. 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 Thanks, Cameron. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.